Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Curzon. Thank you all for, for joining us for our uh, one of our Indeed Flex employer events. Uh, I am, my name is James. I'm part of the Indeed Flex team. Lucky to be part of the team. Um, and we're excited to, to, to have this event and, and really hopefully give everyone a bit, of an, a bit of an understanding of some of what we've been working on in Indeed Flex. More specifically, what we find is, is happening uh, with the candidate market. Um, so I'll start by telling just a very brief story that actually uh, happened to me about uh, this past weekend, actually. So I was out with some friends. Um, I, I don't live too far from here. And so I was out with some friends in, in the Shoreditch area. Um, I'm not nearly cool enough to be there, but um, somehow they let me in. And, uh, and we walk into this restaurant. We had a nice uh, a restaurant reservation um, scheduled. It was my friend and his uh, partner. Uh, it was like one of their anniversaries or birthday, something like that. So we go in, and right when we're about to push the door open, you see a sign on the door. I'm sure you all know what I'm about to say the sign said. It was something along the lines of, uh, we're a bit understaffed. We're sorry. Please be patient. We're working really hard. Essentially, that, that's what it said. So we go in, and we are uh, we sit down. Definitely takes a little bit of time for the water to come out, and then to take the order. The food takes a little bit longer, and you can tell the the, the servers, the wait staff. You can see in the back, everyone is just like plates are flying, dishes all o are all over the place, um, and and you could tell it was it was borderline chaos. I work for Indeed Flex and know the hospitality industry, and so I understand the, the struggles. And so I was sitting there, and you could tell the people next to us kind of looking at their watches, like, what's going on? Like, this is terrible service. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm telling uh, my friends, this is why this is happening. It's because we can't, no one can find workers. So I'm sitting there very calmly. I understand. I feel it. I'm like, hey, I tell the server, I said, hey, no big deal. Like, you, you, we're, we're happy to sit here and enjoy. It's, these aren't my in-laws, so like, don't worry. I don't want to get out of here really quickly. Um, and and, and, and it, it really made me realize something. Um, the only recourse, the only thing that the manager of that establishment can do in a lot of scenarios, especially if it's a big chain restaurant, is go to their office and print out a, a sign that says, hey, we're sorry, just bear with us. That's the position that a lot of the, the folks on the ground floor are in, is they're just putting a sign on the door saying, we're, we're, we're working really hard, just please be patient. And really, it's us, you, me, the leaders within the recruitment industry who are responsible for helping to solve a lot of these problems for the people on the ground level. Like At the end of the day, the onus falls on us to say, what can we do to make sure that it's not about a sign being posted, it's not about the pans flying back and forth. It's about the fact that like, these are human beings that we're trying to employ, that we want to have a good experience working, and we want to also be able to retain them. And if they're going to be running around crazy all the time to be able to, to serve food in an understaffed environment, chances are, what are they going to say after three weeks, six weeks, nine weeks? I'm out of here. And so for us, it's really important to make sure that we're doing what we can to be able to find the right people and find enough people and help, help you and you be able get, have the tools to be able to drive the right staffing levels into your organization so that we're not putting people in this position. But then also, so those people that were sitting next to me who were looking at their watches, so that they come back next time. Because I understand the difficulties but I think there are other people that might not have that same compassion. And so they say, oh, the service here is bad, right? And they don't realize the actual, the actual reason for it. So this has been something that everyone knows has been happening in the industry for quite a while. And it's not just hospitality. It's warehouses and industrial. It's the retail centers. It's care homes. It's really across the board. Um, there's, there's a staffing problem. It's hard to find good quality talent and good quality talent that stays. And so what we've been working on a lot at Indeed Flex is trying to help give information, data, and insights to a lot of our clients on how they can start to solve some of those problems. One of the unique positions and situations that we're in at Indeed Flex is we're kind of at the intersection of a lot of these different areas. 
we have, we are part of the Indeed family. So we have an unbelievable wealth of knowledge from the Indeed organization and the ecosystem about who is posting jobs. How are they posting jobs? Who is looking for jobs? How are they, in, how are they interacting with uh, different job boards? And how are they trying to find employment and what types of employment they're trying to look for? And how is that different than it was a couple of years ago? So having that market data is something that we try to provide to our clients. In addition to that, we also have our clients, everyone in this room. And we talk to you and we have a lot of conversations. Our account management team has conversation to understand anecdotally what's happening on the ground. What are you seeing uh, individually? And then the third component, and, and probably the one that actually I should have mentioned first, is these are the people, the people on the ground that are doing the work that helps us drive the business forward, that helps our finance team um, you know, be able to add up all the revenue, that helps our staffing managers not have to put the, the signs on the door. And so we, we have a huge number of what we call flexors. Those are our workers. And we ask them a lot of questions. And we're, we're, when this, this uh, staffing issue started to happen, we said, hey, let's go to the source and let's find out what has changed about the workforce. A lot of people try to paint with very broad brushes and say, oh, well, it's Brexit. Oh, well, it's COVID. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. And there's probably validity to that. But another thing that I would say is that it's us. It's the type of workers that, that we are recruiting are also consumers that are buying. And the type of product that we're providing to consumers is different than it was five or six years ago. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, was, uh, I was doing a similar presentation um, to the UK Warehousing Association about two or three months ago. I was about to get on stage. And they're sitting there, they're having a panel discussion, very similar to the one that we're going to have in a few minutes. And they had the uh, head of operations for Boohoo, and they had the head of operations for Coca-Cola, as well as a couple other people. And the gentleman from Coca-Cola was so proud. He was saying, you know what? With COVID, um, people were buying more. Like, it was, it was hard because we could originally put our sodas in fountains, and that's how we would sell. Now we're having to can more sodas, send them out to the cash and carries, and be able to have people buy them. And he said, so we've had a huge increase in demand. Also, what we're doing is we're able to customize cans. So you can actually go on coca-cola.com and be able to type your name in or happy birthday, Leanne, or whatever it might be, and they'll be sent to you a week later, and you give them to Leanne for her birthday, and she opens, and she says, oh, this is great. I've got Coca-Cola that has my name on it. He said, we're really excited that we could do that. The lady from Boohoo says, we just rolled out a delivery service where if you order between before 11 p.m., we can guarantee you delivery by the next day. And we're really excited because we're actually going to move it to 12, 12 a.m. So if you order by midnight, get that jacket or those fancy shoes that you wanted to wear out to the club. You can get them. The, you know, you can order it at 11.59 on, on Thursday and be ready to wear it out to the club on Friday. And then I got up on stage and I was thinking about it. And I, and, and I kind of called them out. I said, hey, these people that we're trying to recruit, that we're having a hard time recruiting, they're... They're your workers, but they're also your consumers. What I mean by that is that they have demands that we have allowed them to drive. Two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, if I wanted a Coke, I'd go to the cash and carry and it would say John on it, right? Because I didn't get to choose whose name it was. Now I can decide what I want and I can get it shipped to my house. Four or five years ago, if you wanted to go and get that nice skirt to wear out on the, on the town this weekend, you had to go down to M&S or, um, I don't know, insert any other uh, boutique. I just don't know them. And now you can order it that, that night before and get it delivered to your house the next day. These people that are working in our retail stores, in our warehouses, in our hotels, in our restaurants, they are consumers who have a different demand now, and we've allowed, because of the way that we operate our businesses, because of the efficiencies that we have, because of development, we've allowed them to be able to have different demands. And they're taking those demands now and moving those over because those are the same people. They have their consumer hat on when they order their Boohoo, and they go and they work their night shift, restocking shelves, come home, sleep a little bit, and they want their, 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 uh, their dress. 
So they're wearing the consumer hat at one point and they're wearing the worker or employee hat at another point, but ultimately it's the same person and their demands of what they want from their worker or for their, from their employer has shifted. And so that's what, what we've really realized at Indeed Flex is that the workers and what they want is different. And so what the goal of the next call it hour will be, will be to have Leone, um, one of our amazing talent at Indeed Flex, uh, come up and talk about a survey that we've done of a number of workers and a number of clients about what workers want and what's driving them. We're also going to have uh, two industry leaders in the recruitment sector that we're going to be having a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a discussion with, and they're going to give us some of their insights. But ultimately, the goal of, of this session is really to give everyone in this room a little bit of an unfair advantage. Give you the ability to understand what is it that workers want right now? What are things that we can do to be able to drive uh, a higher candidate pool at the top of the funnel, be able to convert more of these workers because we have a good employer value proposition and be able to retain them more effectively. So our goal is if everyone walks out with one or two things, one or two ideas that you can take back to the rest of your team and say, hey, maybe this is something we can try out, then that was a success for us. So our goal is to help equip you with some of the tools that you might need to be able to help you think outside the box. Because at the end of the day, the easy lever to pull I'm kind of stealing a little bit of uh, Leone Center. The easy lever to pull is just pay people more. But in reality, money does not grow on trees, first of all. And second of all, like, that's not all that people want. It's not, I don't necessarily order from that skirt from Boohoo because I just want the cheapest skirt. Right? There's other things, there's other reasons that I'm ordering it. And so what we want to do is be able to give you that type of insight so that hopefully this can help you become a stronger uh, recruiter, a stronger employer, and be able to retain your people. So with that, if you could all join me in a little round of applause for Leone, who's going to start us off. Thank you, Leone. Morning, all. Um, first of all, obviously, just to introduce myself. So I'm Leone, and I'm one of the enterprise business development managers that work at Indeed Flex. So effectively, I support our client base with MSP solutions and alternate recruitment solutions to support the growth of their organization. So for me, James has sort of touched on what I'll be doing with you guys today. I want to run through some of the insights and the information that we were able to obtain from one of the surveys that we did with our workforce. It's a great opportunity for us to be able to empower you with knowledge, but also to give you a few top tips and I suppose takeaways of things that you can use in your organization moving forward. So in terms of what we'll be running through, we want to have a quick look at how the marketplace has changed. I think we can all notice over the last two years, we're in a really, really unprecedented phase when it comes to recruitment. So if we can have a bit of an overview on the changes in the market the causes of the labour shortage, but also the truth about what your workforce really does want and the understanding behind that. And in addition, I'll be trying to give you a few insights on obviously how to tackle the staffing crisis at the moment. So I think it's pretty clear and it's clear for me within my lifetime that I've never seen a talent shortage of the type that we've been in for the last sort of 12 to 24 months. There is a clear imbalance between sort of supply and demand when we're looking towards workers. And the truth is, there just isn't enough workers out there. So for the clients at the moment in the market, the competition is really, really fierce when it comes to finding talent. So effectively, what we need to start doing is looking at different ways to stand out within that market. So interestingly enough on Indeed, there's been around a 28.5% increase in vacancies over the course of the last 12 to 24 months. Um, and what that means is for clients like yourself, we need to start establishing a way to find more workers. There just isn't enough workers in the market at the moment. And for you as an organization to be able to start fulfilling the allocations and supporting your fulfillment, we need to see what we can do that's gonna be a little bit different. So if we take a look at this, and this is probably from around November 2021 to January 2022, there's been around 1.3 million vacancies that are available at the moment. So for clients, because the competition is fierce, they're trying to think of different things that they should be doing. Should we be increasing our pay rates? Should we be creating alternate roles? Are there different things that we should be doing with the current market and with the current conditions to be able to source those workers? So what we've established is that 
job postings have actually increased by around 48%, okay? And that's obviously since the pandemic. But interestingly enough, when we assessed our own employers on our Indeed Flex platform, the, the one thing that they decided that they wanted to do to find a different way to tackle this problem is increase their salaries. So 28% of our client base increased their salaries substantially. But interestingly enough, out of those 28% and the 48% rise in job postings, we can see that 81% of clients are still struggling to fulfill their roles. So when you look at it like that, it poses the question of, is increasing your pay rates truly the direction that you need to go in? Because if we're increasing the rates, but we've still got an 81% shortage in terms of the staffing, is this the best option? And the truth of the matter is, there's a massive, massive imbalance in the market. And, you know, James touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, one of the key things that we can see is that there is a massive shift in consumer behaviour. So if we take a look at things like Deliveroo, we've always been able to have access to getting food from restaurants. Over the course of the last 12 to 24 months, when you were stuck in the house and there was no opportunity for you to be able to go to a restaurant, every single one of your favorite restaurants was able to post on Deliveroo, on Uber Eats, on Just Eat. What that now means is for all those people that were effectively ordering online throughout that pandemic, all of those restaurants are now open. So not only are people going into restaurants, they're also ordering the same things online, which means the knock-on effect for the client is, not only do they need to staff the restaurant, they need to staff the kitchen, but we also now need people to be able to deliver the food options out there as well, which means, again, it's creating more opportunities and more need for workers in the market. And then if we looked at it from like an industrial perspective, as James touched on, boohoo.com, being able to create orders up until midnight. So if you're able to order clothes up until midnight, what's the impact that that's gonna have on the workforce in the actual warehouse? In order for you to get your orders picked and allocated and out to you within a timely manner, you need additional resource within that warehouse. And by changing the way that consumers think and changing the way that consumers buy, we're actually changing the whole nature of the market and creating more opportunities and more jobs. And then we want to look towards the impacts of Brexit and obviously COVID. So the fact that Brexit occurred meant that we had a massive shift in the workforce. We lost a large proportion of our EU nationals that were very skilled, that were able to fulfill roles within driving, logistics and other areas for us, which actually meant that we're now within a shortage within that area. And then we also obviously look at the impacts of COVID. So. A lot of the time, the workers were already working in retail, they were working in hospitality. They were happy within those roles, but when everything shut down, everyone had to find something new. There wasn't an opportunity to sit at home and not earn, so all of these workers actually shifted from the market that they currently work in to a new opportunity. Whether they move from working in a restaurant to working in an industrial warehouse, that was a shift that they chose. Moving into a new vertical gave them better opportunities for pay. It gave them better opportunities to have the flexibility that they needed. And in fact, it might have just opened up a whole new career avenue that they actually didn't anticipate having in the beginning. So what that's meant is, because the workers have moved to new verticals and new areas, again, there's a further staffing shortage. So when we spoke to the clients to establish what the core issues were, one of the key things that came up was there weren't enough qualified workers in the area. 27.8% of clients said there weren't workers with the right level of qualifications to be able to fulfill the roles and the allocations that they needed within their actual workforce. In addition, shift fulfillment was a key problem for them as well. Because competition is so high, it was really difficult for them to be able to get the headcount that they actually needed to be able to fulfill the demand that they've got, which then had a knock-on effect on the orders that they were able to push out. And then you also need to think of the time it's actually taking clients to fulfill their bookings. Previously, you could just post a job on Indeed. You'd probably get 100 or two applicants. You'd post through them, find the right workers, and it was done very, very quickly. Because there are less workers in the market, clients are having to take a much more targeted approach when it comes to recruitment, okay? Whether it's dedicating more time, more resource, creating booleans, having a better way of actually looking to attract this talent. And actually, 
that type of model takes a lot more time and a lot more resource for you to be able to fulfill the allocations than just simply posting your job on Indeed. So I suppose what I'm trying to say here is employers are truly trying to stand out. If you look at the data, what they're basically trying to say is through that peak period, we can see there was a massive rise of employers trying to do different incentives and different things to be able to stand out in that market. I'm pretty sure you probably saw in peak 2021, we were competing with everything, whether it be Amazon increasing the sign-on bonuses to £2,000, whether it be alternate agencies giving additional sign-on bonuses and retention bonuses. That was a key thing. And, you know, the question I actually ask is, the clients increased all these additional incentives to drive traffic to their site. But the true question was, did they actually retain those workers? Or were those workers just there for the incentive and just there for peak? So the core thing that we need to start understanding is what the workers really want. If we don't understand what the workers want, you're going to have a constant revolving door of talent. It's going to be a really, really costly exercise for you to continue to recruit over and over again for the same allocations and the same roles. So the crucial thing that we need to start doing is asking the workforce the true questions of what they're really looking for. So we actually did a survey um, across our clients and our worker base to actually understand whether or not they feel understood. And a staggering number of active clients at 35% said they didn't really understand the needs or the requirements of their actual workforce. And then if you flip it, around 30% of the employers said that uh, employees said that they felt like their employees didn't understand them. And that's effectively a third of the people in any organisation not understanding the needs of the people that they work with. So when we assessed our Indeed Flex workforce, and we did this survey over around 4,000 workers, we started to ask them some crucial questions about what they actually like about being a temp and what it is that they're looking for. So in terms of what they enjoy most about being a temporary worker, 45.9% of the workers actually came in to say they like work fitting around their own schedule. So whether it be that I want to work to fit around my part-time hours or my second job, it could be for childcare. It could quite simply be that I only want to do one or two days a week to pick up those extra shifts. But by being a temporary worker and giving that flexibility, they're able to fulfill what they actually need and fit work around their schedules and prioritise their own needs. We've also sort of asked them, what are the frustrations? And one of the key things that workers often say is, there's not enough work in my area. Historically, as being a temp, you often find that you're given bookings and allocations in locations that are really difficult to get to, places where there's not a direct bus route, or quite simply, um, they're just too far for you to get to. So the workers are actually looking for opportunities in their area or opportunities that clients are able to provide them access to. So, you know, if there's not a direct bus route, as a client, are you considering that and are you creating one? Are you putting an option in place for those workers so that you can make sure that you are attracting the talent on a day-to-day -day basis to your site? And this one here for me was, you know, really, really important because we watched over the course of 2021 the way that clients chose to incentivize their workforce. And the key thing that they drove was sign-on bonuses. So as I touched on, £2,000 for drivers, £1,000 for warehouse operatives, continuous retention bonuses. But actually looking at the data from speaking to our flexors, only 16% of the workers were driven by sign-on bonuses. The key thing that the workers were driven by is flexibility. The flexibility to build your own schedule, the flexibility to create your own hours, the flexibility to be able to match work to fit your lifestyle. And this is something that is probably the most crucial and the most important factor that workers in this space need flexibility. And the way that the market's changed, we have to start looking at different ways to adapt our approach to fit what the workers truly do require. So looking at this one, what we've actually started to do is consider what the most important factors are when people are looking for work. So looking through the statistics and you know, sort of focusing on the averages, the key things are, pay rate. 
location of the shifts and naturally that level of flexibility. So if we're paying them and they can get to work and they have the ability to create a blended schedule, it's likely that you as a client are gonna fulfill more of your allocations. But interestingly enough, if we're not just considering the averages, the one thing that comes up at the top again at 26.3% is the flexibility. And it just reinforces the fact that workers are looking for flexible options when it comes to their contingent workforce. So I suppose the question is, and the key thing is, there's not just one thing that you need to be doing. Yeah, we can all increase our pay rates. We can continue to increase our pay rates. But if we think about just doing one thing, is that going to drive the talent to the door for you? Is it too much for a worker to actually say to you, I want good pay, I want flexibility, but I also want consistency? Are you able to provide flexibility to your workforce in the sense of, right, we've got a five-day rotor, but I've got Jane who can work Monday, Tuesday, and John that can work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. For me as a client, I'm happy. My entire schedule's covered. For me as a worker, I'm happy because I've got flexible options to fit around my schedule. I've also then got consistency because I've said to you as a client, I can work two days a week, but I can work those two days every single week for the next year. So you have consistency when it comes to your rotor and the worker has consistency when it comes to the schedule, right? So it's a really, really simple way of doing it. But by thinking a little bit out the box to create a rotor that you can use multiple people within, you get what you want and the worker also gets what they want. And then naturally, you need to look at your location. Now, sometimes you're really lucky and you get opportunities in a really central location. At other times, they're in really difficult locations to get to. Sometimes there's not a direct transport link, or if there is, the transport gets you there after the, time, the, the start of the shift time. So we need to start thinking of employers of, what can we do? Can we put on a shuttle bus? Is there a way that we can potentially adjust the start time so that if someone can't get there till 6.30 and the, the shift kicks off at six, can we put that adjustment in place so that we can make sure that we cover what we need to do? So, Doing just one of these things might have a small impact, but it's not going to change the problem that you're in. Effectively, you need to start pulling all of the levers. You need to start considering all of the options and all of the things that the workers want so that you can begin to attract and retain your workforce. So if we look across the board, OK, so 42.7% of employers have actually increased their wages by 5 to 6%. It's quite a substantial rise. But looking at the market, well, we can all see it. It's not enough. Increasing the wages by 5 to 6% just isn't doing what we need it to do. The way that the market is working at the moment, we can actually see that inflation's on the rise. So if you increase your wages by 5 to 6%, you're basically just matching the inflationary rise. It's not having a true impact. And then if you start to consider, well, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase all my pay rates by a pound an hour. But then your competitor down the road is going to increase theirs by a pound an hour. So the question is, what are you doing to stand out? And the truth of the matter is, I'll be very honest, you're not standing out. You're just exactly the same as every other employer in the market. For you to stand out, you're going to have to increase it by three quid, four quid on the hour, which sounds attractive for the worker, but for you as a client, is it a sustainable option? Do we all have enough money so that we can just completely increase pay rates over and over again? We don't have unlimited spend. You don't have unlimited spend. We'd all like to have unlimited spend, but unfortunately we're not in that position at the moment. So we actually need to start thinking about the workers' wants. What do the workers want and how can I apply that to my existing model? So a couple of suggestions from us at Flex, I suppose. Flexibility is key. So as I touched on earlier, split shift patterns. Is there an opportunity for us to split down the shifts? Can we have one worker working a few days a week and another worker covering the other areas of the week? Can we give the workers a little bit more control and choice? Rather than forcing them into set patterns and set rotors that don't fulfill their needs, can we give them an element of flexibility to either introduce a new shift pattern or adjust it ever so slightly so it fits the way that they live or 
the way that they need to get to work on a day-to-day -day basis. And then when we create flexibility, can we ensure that we maintain consistency? So if we are gonna let someone work for two days a week, can we give them that guaranteed two days a week for the remainder of their contract so that they know that they've got commitment from you? Because they might be a temp worker, but it's not too much of a tall order for, us, for them to ask for consistency and commitment from a client. And then we wanna look at location, whether it's in a central location or pretty far out. Is there on-site parking? Sounds small, but people don't like paying for parking. I hate paying for parking myself. So is there on-site parking? Is there a way that we can do this for them to attract them so that they know they can drive to work and they don't have to then pay to park at work as well? Can we create buses? Are there different things that we can do? Put alternate bus routes on to start guiding workers in from alternate locations so that they can get to your site on a day-to-day -day basis. If we're going out to more than one direct location that surrounds us, are we gonna start attracting new talent? And also, are we gonna start attracting a different demographic of talent? And the likelihood is that you probably will. And again, small things like, what are the food options? Is there a food van available for them on site? Do they have a free canteen? Do they have free vending machines that they can utilize on site? It sounds really strange, but little sweeteners really do start to add up. And these are the things that the workers are truly looking for when they're picking other clients. Because if you're all paying the same, what are the extra benefits that you're giving them? And then we hit on the pay rate again. So 30% increase, probably not the most sustainable option, but if you truly want to stand out on pay alone, that's where you really do need to be. But the other thing that I think is crucial is benefits. What benefits are you offering to your temporary workforce? What benefits would that worker normally get post parity? And could you give it to them pre parity? Are there different things that your own internal workers get that the temps don't get? Are they truly an extension of your workforce if they're not gaining access to those benefits? And one of the things that we did at Flex is we included a benefit package for all of our flexors. Our temporary staff are an extension of our workforce. They get access to things like perk box so that they feel like they're a part of that permanent community. We give them things like um, sick pay, mental health cover, different options to really help support them. And the reason we did that was because we did a survey to understand that over 67% of workers want incentives outside of financial benefits. So by asking questions, listening to them, and creating the correct level of benefit packages so that they can support themselves and also develop themselves, we're giving the workers another reason to remain and retain with Indeed Flex, and also to stick with the client base that we've got in place. And I suppose because we're a data-driven platform, we're in a better position to advise our clients, okay? We're able to capture the information through the platform, so it could be based on the locations, it could be the skills of the workers, it could be the pay rates, but the data that we capture through the platform from our clients and our workers, we can share with our clients. We can use it as an opportunity to, edu to educate. We can use it to predict fulfillment and actually say, well, actually, this is a trend that we see here. And if you maybe create a shorter shift pattern of four to five hours to cover that gap, this is the impact it's gonna have on your fulfillment. So by using data, we can leverage that to support our clients, to share the insights with you, to make sure that you've got the right information to support your growth. And I suppose just lastly for me, just to touch on a bit of a case study here, and this one was actually one of, one of my clients, to be honest with you. Um, a very large e-commerce warehouse, warehouse based in Magna Park, Leicester. I don't know if any of you know the location, but it is truly notoriously difficult to staff. Um, it's really not easy. So what we actually noticed with this client was they had a four-on-four-off four -off shift pattern. And for anyone who's ever worked within a four-on-four-off four -off shift pattern, you know it's really difficult to be able to attract workers to it because it, it's just pretty old school and not really fit for purpose with the way that the market works currently. One of the key issues that they found was we could only get workers in the location to work up to 20 hours due to other commitments or whether it be due to their visa. And they had a really rigid onboarding process um, that took a very long time. So we had to start thinking of different things that we could do for them to be able to hit the headcount that they actually needed to get the orders out. So one of the key things we did was we put on that shuttle bus. We were able to go to locations outside the direct, you know, sort of five mile to 10 mile radius by shuttle busing workers in 
on a daily basis, enticing people from, say, Coventry, Nuneaton, Rugby, different locations, so that the client was able to fulfill the demand. We actually did a training academy where, rather than onboard the workers in our offices or doing it remotely, we did it on site. We did the recruitment on site, ensuring that the workers showed up on that given day. We then did went from the recruitment straight into their induction. So the workers knew exactly what they were doing. They were verified and eligible to start work straight away. And then we also used the data to support them with creating a few new shift patterns. We could see where the gaps were in the rotor. We could see what we weren't able to fulfill and what the client was struggling with. And what we were then able to do was create new shift patterns, which allowed them to fulfill those gaps. So if they could see we had a shortfall of six hours in the middle of the day, but if we could put a new shift pattern in place, we were able to support them with that. And it's important to take away from this that actually we're not telling you to change your entire operating model. We're not saying change all the shift patterns that you've got in place and flip your business upside down. But we are asking you to take a look and see where the gaps are what flexible approaches we can put in place and what are the things that we can do ever so slightly differently that's going to help support you and really help drive that fulfillment. So the results, we filled over 650 additional shifts for the client. Um, by creating these new shift patterns, we was able to create what we call a flexi pool where we recruited another 80 workers that were able to work these new flexible shift patterns. They were able to fulfill the gaps in the rotor and they were able to get the orders out for the client. And overall, it resulted in a 12% increase in fulfillment across the board. So what it truly shows you is, by making a few tweaks, a few amendments, a few small changes, it can really, really have a big impact on your operation. So, so thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Leonie. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll, we'll take some questions in a moment. But um, uh, we have a couple, of, a couple of guests that have joined us um, from, from quite far away, actually, both of them. Um, we've got uh, immediately here to my left, Nicole Kirkland, who is the head of talent and resourcing for Interstate Hotels and Resorts. Uh, and we also have Ryan Candy, who is the head of change employee experience and people performance uh, at, at Sodexo. So um, as, as we get started, if it maybe to, to, to get us kicked off, if, if each of you could give a bit of an overview of yourself, what your role is, and uh, maybe how uh, some of the staffing challenges have, have impacted your business and what you've been, what you've been working on recently. Nicole? Sure. Uh, thanks, James. So um, good morning, everyone. My name is Nicole. Um, yeah, so I work for a, a company called Interstate Hotels and Resorts, and we are a third-party hotel management company. Um, at a very basic level, what that means is we operate hotels on behalf of owners. Um, so if you want to buy a hotel, um, you would maybe go to a brand um, like Hilton or IHG or whoever that might be, Marriott. Um, you would set up your hotel, um, but um, a lot of hotel owners these days are not hoteliers. Um, they are property developers. Um, they are um, inherited wealth from family. Um, so they don't know how to run a hotel and they would come to a business like ours. And we provide that external support. So everything from HR, operations, finance, revenue, sales, um, maintenance, everything across the board um, and support those hotels. So we operate a portfolio of just over 100 hotels across the UK and Europe. And that's everything um, across the board from... Um, you know, your small IBIS budget, um, 70 beds, um, bedroom factories, um, right the way through to your big full service, um, all singing, all dancing, um, resorts, um, and everything in between. Um, so yeah, the, the, the kind of, uh, well, I've been in this role for about um, coming on four years now, three and a half, four years. Um, and it has been, you know, an, an exceptional uh, learning curve for me. I started as a resourcing manager, looking after the general manager estate and um, the recruitment um, for those uh, for that kind of level of team member. And um, taking on the the kind of larger piece, setting the policy, setting the the, the structure, the the process around recruitment and how we develop our talent has been exceptional over the last couple of years. Um, 
coming out of COVID, I think we can all say that was a shock to the system. Um, we all went from zero to 100 really quickly. Um, I guess some of the things that, that I'll have to say might be a bit controversial. For example, we don't have an attraction problem. I firmly believe that that's not necessarily, by and large, the issue. The issue is retention. Um, so for me, the big focus is retention and um, how do we get people to stay? Um, yes, there are gaps. Yes, there are um, areas of the, um, the country where that attraction piece we really need to work on. Um, but I think retention is, is at the heart of our focus right now. Thank you. Ryan? Thank you. Um, so thank you. Thank you for introducing me, James. I'm uh, Ryan Candy. Um, I... So Sodexo is a, a large French-based, um, traditionally known as a catering business, but we are uh, an FM business as well. So we've got around 412,000 employees worldwide, um, operating just over 60 countries and uh, have kind of consolidated revenues across a group of around 22 billion euros. So we're quite a big beast. Um, I would say the the, the the main challenge that I see, I mean, I'm not a recruiter. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, my job is essentially retention, employee experience, et cetera. Um, the, the main challenge I see is that we have got so many different clients. So we will be contracted by, by a large corporate, a private school, a prison, a hospital. It could be any sort of, of setting to deliver services on that site. So what that does is it creates almost thousands and thousands of sites that are all entirely different. And in order for some, for, for an organization like Sodexo to create a consistent employee experience when the sites are also vastly different, the clients are also vastly different, the culture in each individual site is different, it can be really hard to understand what do you need to do to kind of help retain people. Um, because, you know, no two people's needs are the same, we know that. But when you're trying to kind of create organizational, uh, organization-wide solutions, it's really hard because the, the needs of each site are very different. Um, I would say that I kind of agree with, with Nicole on the, the thing around attraction. I don't necessarily think it's just an attraction problem. I think people that are HR practitioners and recruiters are, are kind of, we're up against it because the businesses are telling us we're struggling to deliver demand, we're struggling to service customers and service need. Is that because of vacancies or is that because of potentially other things like the way that we're managing our workforce, uh, you know, much to uh, the, the points raised in the earlier presentation? Um, so, so my view would be if, um, if an organization really wants to tackle the challenges that they're, they're kind of seeing or perceiving with their workforce, they need to really start with an EVP. Now, EVPs are not just things that large organizations have, and they're not recruitment tools. So I think people get really confused between EVP and employer brand. They're two very different things. Employer brand is a sales tool. EVP is a business tool. It's used to articulate your promise as an organization to your, your teams. And if you can't really articulate your promise and essentially your EVP, people aren't going to understand why work at Sodexo. So it's, that's why I say it's really, really important, I think, from a retention perspective, to have a really strong EVP that articulates the promise that you make contractually, clearly not le legal contracts, but the, the, the promise that you make to, to the workforce. You need to meet that. Otherwise, you, you deliver an inconsistent employee experience, you see people leave, you see people disengaged, and then you run into staffing problems. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so maybe for 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 first question based on 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 what you just said can can you walk me through what are the things that you think that a lot of workers or or your employees are valuing right now um leone had said you know there there's a lot of areas there's pay there's flexibility there's schedule there's training opportunities um, can, can you maybe speak to which of those areas your team has been focusing on? Obviously, it sounds like more from a retention standpoint. And, and also, Ryan, maybe also for you, if you and maybe you could start with it. Um, how have you tried to or have you edited or changed your EVP to be able to reflect some of those changes in, in, in workers? Um, yes and no. I think we're, we're in the process right now of really clearly articulating our EVP much better because it was done a while ago and it needed a bit of a refresh so we're in the middle of doing that in terms of what i think people want and need it really starts you know back to uh, the uni's point around understanding people's wants and needs 
going back to what I said, you know, no two people are the same. So if you if you can gather data, data is king. You cannot make assumptions with this kind of thing. Otherwise, it will land on deaf ears. Um, so, so taking time to really understand what people want is, is absolutely critical. And then acting upon that within the means of the context of your business. So clearly it's not going to be uh, feasible for every business to invest in, I don't know, a, an all singing, all dancing EAP program or something like that. Um, that being said, I think it's really important when, when kind of designing your EVP and the, your promise. I'm going to use the word promise from now on because it's less corporate. Um, when you're designing your promise to employees, I think it's critical to kind of touch on everything that people are saying they want to a degree. Now, you don't have to invest millions in a new e-learning platform or, or, as I say, an EAP or something like that. I think what you do need to do, though, is manage expectations really carefully in the sense of being very clear as to, to what the, the business can deliver for someone, but also kind of being clear you know, in terms of what you expect in, in return. So what I mean by that is you can go out there and kind of say, right, you, you can have access to a discounts platform, you can you can have access to an EAP, you can have access to private GP, you can have access to e-learning. All of these things are great, but in return, we expect performance. So it's almost like a, a contractual cycle of we will give you this, in return, you know, high performance is expected. And that's how, and that's how you create a high performing culture. You, you know, you give, you get, it's just a circle really. Um, in terms of what we've done, I would say throughout the pandemic, the single most impactful change that we made um, was real investment in people's health and caring about them as individuals. So we went out um, within the UK and Ireland, I, I can use a, a local example. Um, so within the UK and Ireland, we offered everybody in our teams, everyone that wasn't previously in scope for a uh, private medical, uh, sorry, private GP service and a, uh, a life assurance scheme. We offered it to everyone and the cost to our business realistically in the grand scheme of things was minimal when you consider the return that that makes i'm sure every single one of us in here have experienced the wrath of a gp receptionist <laughs> yeah phoning up and asking for an appointment and you're told there's one in six months time being able to offer your team a service that enables them to get a private gp appointment for free within 20 minutes that that you know that's amazing and I'm not saying everybody needs to do that, but those kinds of little actions that are small, but you know, sizable investments from the organization improve someone's quality of life so much. And it demonstrates the organization's value in the fact that we care for them. So to answer your question in short, investing in people to show that you care for them as people, not as just employees is, is critical. And that's what's worked for us. Cool. Yeah, um, so I guess for me to, to kind of go back and um, reevaluate a bit about what Le Leonie was talking about and um, thinking about what it is that, that workers really want. Um, uh, and, and what's interesting to me is, is quite recently we got some data through from Caterer, the, um, the dreaded competition, <laughs> the specialist, the hospitality specialist job board. Um, that showed us that 80% of the workforce are now looking at pay. That is their kind of primary um, need, which, yeah, absolutely, the cost of living has now went through the roof. Um, very closely followed by development and um, benefits. Um, so there wasn't much in it. There was 80% wanted pay, then um, I think it was about 65% a piece um, for uh, benefits and um, development opportunities. But what, what what was interesting for, uh, and we're talking specifically about hospitality here, what was interesting was when we asked um, those uh, candidates um, what attracts you to work in hospitality, one of the things that they said was pay um, and flexibility. And then um, when we asked them what... Um, what repels you from working in hospitality or what puts you off from working in hospitality, they said pay and flexibility. Um, so that kind of uh, let us see that there is a bit of misconception in the market about what we offer as a sector, as an industry. Um, so for me, the, the kind of key focus was around that transparency piece um, and really educating our candidates as to what it is that we give you. What, what does working in hospitality, what does working for interstate give you 
And it's not just the bump in salary because we've, we've shown that that's not the silver bullet, that is not the catch-all. Um, it's about telling the whole story. So we've done a huge piece of work around really simple things like our adverts. What does our adverts tell you? Well, first of all, it's not a huge screed four page job description for a start. Everybody knows what a food and beverage assistant does. Everybody knows what a bartender does. Everyone knows what a receptionist does. So we started looking at how that was shaped and what is the story that we are telling our candidates so it's very benefit heavy. So first of all, it's who are we? Who are we as a business? What does that mean for you? Um, what are you gonna get when you come and work with us? Um, and, I'll, and I'll chat more to our EVP um, in a bit, um, but we list those basic benefits that you get working with us. And then we go into a bit more about that specific site. So similar to Ryan, we work with lots of individual owners that all have their own agenda. Um, so we have lots of stakeholders to please. And that means lots of varying business types. Um, so we go a bit into more detail about what does that hotel look like? So what is the culture? What's the team culture? How can you progress within that hotel? And then what are the opportunities above that hotel? So where can you go in the industry? Um, it's about telling that whole story um, and, and talking about the, um, the flexibility and stuff. Now we've still got a long way to go. We have a huge, huge, we're going through a huge piece of um, change, I think as a nation just now in the recruitment landscape. But I think as a business, and I'm sure any of you here that are in hospitality as well will agree with me, as an industry, we have a huge culture shift um, happening just now. We are changing the hearts and minds of traditional hiring managers across the, the, um, the portfolio just now. Um, and changing that mindset around, but you have to do a good day's work to earn your money. Um, and I'm not giving them this because, you know, they only work four hours a week or whatever, um, that's just not good enough anymore. Um, that whole kind of perception around, I need two full-time workers to cover, um, you know, uh, a week's work in the kitchen, for example. Well, do you need two full-time workers or do you need six part-time workers to, um, you know, Leonie and James' point earlier, someone that works every Monday or someone that works every Tuesday and Wednesday, we need to get out of this mindset of, but you're working in hospitality, you need to be available every weekend because that's our busiest periods. Well, yeah, it is, but why, why, what, what are we doing with those people that work, can work every Monday and Tuesday? Because they're valuable too. Um, so it's about changing hearts and minds. And I think for me, giving the workers the full story, giving them the, the, the opportunities that we have as an industry as well. Th thank you. So that that's interesting, and I think you you both you both hit on hit on an interesting point a little bit. Like we we all work within, and especially the two of you, matrix organizations. Um, you know, R Ryan with with it being Sodexo being a huge a huge company in mul multiple different countries, and Nicole with yours having a management structure. We've also got owners that that are on another level. Can you talk a little bit about? Um, you know, you have some great ideas and there are some great thoughts, but like, how do you actually drive the change? Because at the end of the day, your teams are responsible for, hey, we need more talent, bring more people in top of funnel and, and then, hey, Nicole, we're losing a lot of people, go solve that. And you can come up with a lot of ideas, but actually implementing those are going to require changes within the rest of the business that are going to uh, influence and, and impact the operational team. So could you maybe, Nicole, talk a little bit about uh, what have you done to be able to drive some of these changes internally? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think that that change is, is a really big piece of work and it, it's culture, it's um, it's mindset, it's it's really digging out entrenched thinking um, that's been part of our industry for so long. Um, and honestly, when you're talking at that level, when you're looking stakeholders in the eye, um, it's about the pounds and pence, isn't it? It's about the ROI. Um, it's about giving that data. So, you know, we've spoken quite a lot about um, having the data um, and being really clear on your intentions. Um, so for me, the biggest um, impact that I've seen is um, the education around the commerciality of recruitment. Um, so what does it actually cost you to hire an individual? Um, one of our hotels we worked out, um, it, it was working out four and a half grand to, to get someone through the door. And that was just a frontline team worker on minimum wage um, 
And, you know, this was blowing people's minds. But when you think about, you know, not just the, the cost to recruit, the job board cost, um, the, the, the cost of your hiring manager salary, all those little things. But then you start to factor in things like mandatory training. So if everyone does four hours of e-learning or whatever that looks like, then the, the, the time that you are um, like non-effective or, or you're learning. So that 12 week onboarding period, we are paying people and we're offering pay, often paying someone else to train them. That's 12 weeks of salary that we're essentially flushing down the toilet every time we hire someone if they're not gonna work out. So when you hear hiring managers talking about, we need arms and legs, is that the right way? Is that the right thing to look at? So I think, yes, that education piece around the commerciality of recruitment um, has been incredibly impactful when we are going to stakeholders to talk about the severity of this. Um, and that often is the, is the, the precursor to change. Um, and getting that out into the operation, of course, is it's a lot of um, reinforcing a message. It's about um, showing the positives. It's about having great case studies and, and examples that we can draw on to say, look, guys, this worked. And not only did it save you time and money, but now we've got a really engaged workforce. Um, so it's a no brainer. Why aren't we doing it? Um, so yeah, I, I think at a very basic level, people need to see the ROI on what change looks like. Um, and then it's about being repetitive, about being persistent and consistent and uh, really driving that message home. So it's gonna sound like I really disagree with Nicole, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna answer this question through the lens of my very simple mind. Um, <laughs> if, so I, I do agree with everything Nicole said, but if you fundamentally cannot answer the question, what's in it for me? when you're having the conversation with the decision makers or any stakeholder, your change isn't gonna land. If you can't answer that question, it's not gonna happen. So whilst all of what Nicole has articulated makes complete sense, and it's the stuff that you kind of need to do in terms of building the foundations, if you can't answer that question, don't even bother trying because you're wasting more money. So, that's, yeah. <laughs> Uh, w would you like to expand a little bit on that? And 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 so, you, you know, let, let's let's picture uh, a, a scenario where it is a huge cost to hire. Maybe the P and L isn't owned by that individual site manager. Like, how do you try to frame a conversation like that up with them, where it does start to impact them? Well, I usually do it like I just did, and then they just say, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but on a more practical front, if you you really need to have that question in the back of your mind through any change management, not just in, in recruitment. What's in it for me? So if I'm a CEO, if I'm a managing director, if I'm a manager of a particular business line and I'm experiencing challenges in recruitment, I'm going to go to HR, I'm going to go to my HR business partner and say, what are we going to do about this? The HR BP is then going to say to you, da 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 All the stuff that we know and I'm not going to repeat because we all know it as, as, as HR professionals. Um, but if you're proposing a change to them, as in saying things like, we need to change the way that we talk about ourselves externally, we need to change that we on, the way we onboard people, we need to change the benefits, you know. These are all things that it's great, but the first thing they're gonna ask is, and what's that gonna do? And that is the, what's in it for me? Because if, if, if what you're proposing and what the change you're proposing isn't gonna actually answer the exam question, you're not actually doing any real, you know, adding any real value. So I, I think it, it's just simple consulting, simply trying to understand what people's needs are from, you know, from if you're an HR practitioner, what your manager's needs are, what is the, what's the business's needs? And then when you're coming up with solutions, make sure that they answer the exam question because otherwise it's not adding any value. Great. Um, so can, can you talk maybe through what are some of the things that you've been working on over the past or, or you're planning to work on over the past year to, to drive some of these changes that you're talking about? Obviously, retention is is more of a more of an important factor for you. So do you have any insight on some of the some of the projects you're working on to be able to drive some of these changes? Yeah, so I mean, hospitality is an ever turning door, isn't it? Um, I think we have one of the higher turnover um, uh, labour turnover percentages in uh, in the, the kind of working world. 
Um, so yeah, we, we're always trying to get new people in. We, we lose about half of our workforce every year, so it, it's a, a revolving door for us. Um, and a, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I don't think attractions the necessarily the the glaring issue that we have. Um, we had more people want to work with us last year than we ever have, um, and uh, that's not just you know as part of that. Q1, we were all in lockdown. We had a couple of vacancies. We were seeing stupid amounts of um, applicants. I think one of our London hotels saw 1,400 applicants in two days for a receptionist role. Of course, no one's going to sit and scrape through um, 1,400 CVs. So um, it, it wasn't just in those times, you know, where where the competition was, was not really there. Um, it was throughout the year. So we consistently saw more average applicants per vacancy than we have ever seen before. So that tells me that attraction's not necessarily the issue. I think, um, and, and I'll say it again, it's culture. It's the, what are we doing with those applicants? So if I focus on our frontline team members, we are, um, we have, you know, city center locations that have that 100, 200 um, applicant, um, number of applicants applying for roles for food and beverage, reception, um, KP, whatever that may look like. Um, but I've still got hiring managers coming to me to say, I still can't find anyone. And, and you know, I'm baffled because I'm thinking, how, you've got 200 applicants in front of you. How can you not find someone? None of them have worked in a hotel reception before, Nicole. It's just not going to work. Right, okay. Um, so, you know, we are favouring, we're favouring skill set or uh, what we perceive as a skill set over um, the desire to want to work with us. Um, and I firmly believe that an industry like hospitality, it needs that new blood, it needs that. I mean, if you remember, who gave you your first opportunity in business? Um, did you ever work on a hotel reception before? Did you ever work um, serving tables before? No, probably not. Someone gave you that opportunity. So it then becomes a, a training issue and a retention issue. And one of the big things that we focused on over the last year, we, we noticed that we were losing the majority of our people within the first 12 weeks. So people were joining and very quickly thinking, oh wait, this isn't for me, I'm out of here. Um, and, and for a while that's been a bit of a revolving door within itself or a catch-22 situation because it was through that period where the customer was um, was probably more demanding, our guests were more demanding. Um, they had just came out of two years of lockdown themselves. They wanted to go and spend a nice break by the beach um, to be stood in a queue to check in, for someone to be you know, not really sure of what they're doing. Um, guests were losing their temper quicker. They were demanding service quality to be higher and higher and higher. Um, and that was putting additional pressure on our workforces um, so that training element's been a huge, um, a huge focus for us and making sure that we've got the right onboarding. Um, and one of the things that we did pre-pandemic was um, move to digital onboarding. It's faster, it's more efficient, it makes sense for everybody. Um, then what we did during the pandemic, when we quickly realised that many candidates were not getting an induction, um, at even the very basics, they were getting, you know, and you go into the pot wash, get cracking, um, was we introduced a centralised induction. Um, so we had um, our central admin team or our business partners, whoever was available to get all new starts, join a call every Monday, take them through the basics. How do I book a holiday? Where do I go on my first day? How do I get paid? When do I get paid? Um, how can I request time off? What do I do if I'm not well? Um, all those basics. Um, and then they went through their mandatory e-learning with them. That was another big thing that we saw there was um, a bottleneck of people coming in on day one and not actually being able to do the job that they're being paid to do because they have to go through hours of e-learning um, in order to be legal to carry out that work. Um, and often in a property where there's one laptop in the building. So you've got, you know, swathes of people queuing up to do mandatory learning. So we, we said, why do they need to come into the hotel? Why do they need to be in the business? Can't they do this from home? Everyone's got a, ho a laptop or a smartphone or an iPad at home. Um, why don't we just get them on a Teams call? The first day they work from home, we do their induction centrally. We... Um, 
we get them through their e-learning. We have a business partner on hand to support them if they need any help. What a great first day that is. You know, you feel valued. Someone has taken the time to introduce you. There's no pressure around getting on um, the floor and, you know, getting on with the day job. And then that means that day two, you are set up to go into your new place of work and, and start your role um, in the practical sense of the word. Um, so we saw that really impacted our retention rates within that first 12 weeks. Also really basic things around the messaging um, that we were giving to um, candidates when they onboarded with us. Um, so a bit of information around, welcome to this um, business, this is what it is. So um, here's what your role might be. We introduced a role called a team coach, which was someone that was at an operational level on the floor alongside them that could work shoulder to shoulder, to shoulder and show them the kind of standard operating procedures, signpost them as to where they could go. That would alleviate their line manager to make sure that they were managing and not on the floor showing people how to pour pints. So we introduced a team coach role and that became a development opportunity for other people within the business as well. So again, that... Um, kind of reinforced that retention strategy. Um, so when these new people started, they were getting a welcome booklet that said, here's what your first 12 weeks is gonna look like. Here's what you're gonna get out of it. You're gonna be introduced to a team coach and weeks one to two, this is what you're gonna be doing. And weeks three to six, this is what you're gonna be doing. You'll have a conversation with your line manager. You'll talk about your progress. We scrapped um, probationary periods. I think that's a, an antiquated, um, process that's not really mandatory, especially when you look at UK law now and, and you can dismiss anyone within the first two years without cause. So why do we have these mandatory three month periods where we're saying, well, you know, if you don't pass your probationary period, that's you out the door. And um, all you're doing is putting pressure on people to perform within that first three months. And let's be honest, who can do their job to the best capacity within the first three months? Not many of us. Um, so we got rid of that. Um, and that supported, that took the pressure off, that allowed more fluid conversations to start to happen within the workplace. Um, and as part of that, um, that dialogue that you're having, that messaging that you're giving with the new candidates, you're also telling them what, what your development looks like. So before they even step foot in the business, they have um, a welcome book that says, this is what your first 12 weeks look like. Um, and here's what the next 12 years could look like. Here's where you can go in this role. Here's what the opportunities are in interstate. And actually, here's all your other benefits that you're gonna get with it, and here's how you can find out about them. Um, and that really supported that retention. Um, it supported the offer acceptance rate. So um, we saw a huge dramatic uh, fall over the, the the pandemic of people that would accept our offer but then not really start with us because they've got multiple offers on the table. So that made us really a bit more enticing at that point. Um, so yeah, it was just, again, back to what Leone was saying, making small changes but really paying attention to people rather than just picking up the phone and saying, you've got a job, you start a week on Monday and then hoping that they show up. That's that's great. I, I love it. I mean, it's very all-encompassing, mm -hmm. right? And 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 I think it, it made me think about what Ryan had mentioned about the, the what's in it for me and if I go to a manager of one of the sites now and I say, hey, tell me about your, your first day process a year ago compared to today, before it was a line of people out the door waiting to use a laptop, now it's, I don't have to worry about anything until day two because it's all centralized. And so that's very immediate uh, benefit that they're gonna get. It's gonna drive also the ability for you to implement more future changes. Yeah. It's great. Ryan? I'm conscious of time. So yes. maybe instead of me kind of talking about what, what we're doing at Sodexo, if I could leave uh, one kind of parting piece of advice, just talking to, to one of Nicole's points around, you know, you, you get all these applications and none of them have been a hotel receptionist before. I think every industry needs to switch away from experience-based hiring because I, one of the things that drives me absolutely wild, and I could very easily go on a rant here, but I'm not going to, <laughs> is when you see job adverts that say, must have 10 years experience of X, and I kind of think to myself, okay, 10 years experience to one person versus another person are two very different things. And you could be a terrible performer, but with 10 years of experience and automatically qualify for that role. But then you're discounting the next gen talent that's maybe just fresh out of university six months ago and will absolutely set your business alight. 
it's just close-mindedness, if you ask me. And granted, experience does come into things. So I guess my parting advice would be, think about skills-based hiring and, and potential-based hiring rather than the amount of experience someone has. I'm going to use a rather personal example here, and, and that is, it's about myself, clearly, personal. Um, I started with Sodexo 10 years ago as a, as a kitchen porter. And because I was given opportunity after opportunity and I was nurtured like a plant, um, <laughs> I've grown into a, a head of HR role. That wouldn't happen if the the business had the mindset of what sadly many businesses do, and that is you must have experience in order to be good. It's simply not true. So to finish, open your minds and the world has endless possibilities in attracting and retaining talents. That's all. Th thank you. If, if I could maybe add add two points. Well, I was uh, I was um, reading an article recently, and it was an, an op ed, and and I hire salespeople, and so they were talking about. They said, you know, and and it really resonated with me because this happened to me as well. I've, I've noticed it. I said, you know. There's this whole talent war, and everyone is leaving and going to other companies. And they said, you know, and they were talking about how you have to have four years of sales experience to get this job. They said, at the end of the day, we're just taking all, of, like, the middle and low performing people mm -hmm. and moving them over to another company so they can be middle and low performers over there as well. And this person was saying, you know, I've had some of my best experience hiring people who used to be in teaching People who used to be in hospitality, people who don't, they have the right soft skills, maybe that not, not that experience. And so they're saying, we actually, by, by saying we're not going to hire people with that experience, um, are, are actually getting better candidates. And, and then one other thing, I think you had mentioned a little bit, Nicole, and, and, and Ryan, you, you really drilled at home about uh, the watering of the plant of Ryan, is that uh, a development plan is unbelievably critical. Um, I'm, I'm really proud to say that, that in DeedFlex, we've gotten much, much better at having individual development plans, career path conversations, being able to promote with, from within is, is, is a huge, huge way to be able to make sure you're retaining talent, but also you're taking these people that are the best and continuing to allow them to grow. Because chances are, Sodexo probably wouldn't have found someone as good as you for that role or ha that had the full knowledge. You are better at your job now because you were a kitchen porter. Um, and just hiring someone from one of your competitors that we could name who did the same role somewhere else probably wouldn't be as effective. So, so great, great, great uh, examples, and thank you so much. Just um, on that point, I, I have a philosophy, and I, I, if this isn't helpful, then it's not helpful, but I hope it will be to at least one person. I have a philosophy around attracting and retaining talent, and that is, as organizations, we focus on, so the, the, the philosophy is build by borrow, as organizations and as people, our natural instinct is to go out to market and buy new talent in. But if we can kind of shift that towards building internally or maybe borrowing talent through the likes of Indeed Flex, and we go with a more balanced build by borrow approach, you won't have half the problems you have around trying to constantly recruit externally. That's all. I like that. Uh, do we have time for maybe one question? Would that be okay? Yeah. Anyone? Oh. Sorry, hello. I'm Daphne. I work for uh, Cheval Residences Hospitality. And um, we, yeah, we, we have similar challenges, but where it's difficult for me and um, it's the what is in there for them because there, it's something they don't see yet, yeah. um, that these talents, they're different, they have different backgrounds. Also, I do a lot of work on um, in inviting them to be more flexible in terms of timetable, like, um, because we require flexibility in our industry. Yeah. We don't offer it. Yeah. And so this is where, as a recruiter, my job is limited because they are managers and they have their habits since five, ten years. We're very proud at Cheval. We have uh, long careers. Most of my HODs are in their positions since more than seven years. So it's uh, so on giving up expertise, uh, experience, expertise. I uh, we manage, but on can you give them flexibility? I'm a single mother, so I <laughs> I always tell them, you know, we, we I had to leave frontline positions and go in support so that I can be here for my child. And this is so hard to change. And, you know, you said develop the EVP, everything. It's um, I think this is where, you know, I'm still dealing with great challenges. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's a great point. And I'm still going through that journey myself, Daphne. And um I, I would say the one piece of advice that I can give is find one hiring manager that's on board with what you're saying and um, develop a great example and a great case study. And that is the silver bullet that you're going to need 
to change the hearts and minds across your organisation. Is uh, And you will, there'll be somebody in your organisation that's just like, I hear everything that you're saying and I think this is the right thing to do. And just hone in that one person, develop a great case study and take that to the board. Take the data, take the, the return on investment as well. Um, because when it gets to that higher level, pounds and pence is where you're starting to change hearts and minds. Um, uh, and I think that's how you start to turn the tide with those things. Thank you so much. So I saw some other hands. Um, I want to be respectful of our panelists' time and everyone else. So if you do have any other questions, you can feel free to come down and, and speak with w one of us if we're available. But uh, thank you. Thank you to the two of you for your time and your insights. It was, was very, very helpful. Thank you.